Great. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for uh, your willingness to come and uh, be with us here at Legacy Christian Church. And we've got people watching from all four of our campuses right now, from uh, our Olathe campus, Overland Park, Lee Summit, and uh, Blue Valley campuses. Um, and we're just excited to interact with you because I know I've had several people in our church that have brought me your book, which I have right here, Another Gospel. And uh, our pastor, our, our Olathe campus pastor, Darren Wade, actually recommended it to me about a year ago. And I finally got around to reading it in my list of books to read. Um, and I loved it. And I, I really loved uh, how you organized it and your story. And so could you just take a minute and uh, maybe introduce yourself to our church a little bit and tell us a little bit about your story and how you came to write this book? Yeah, well, thanks for having me. I'm I'm really excited to get to talk with you. And uh, yeah, basically my story is that I grew up in a Christian home. I loved Jesus as far back as I can remember. I actually don't remember a time in my life before I was aware of the presence of God, aware that the Bible was his word, that Jesus was my savior. I was just all in from a very young age, really loved the Bible. I read and studied the Bible as early as I could read or write. And um, when I was a kid, I never had like an intellectual reason why I believed Christianity was true, but I, I didn't know that I needed that because I was I was just so persuaded and so convinced in my bones. And so it really wasn't until I was a lot older. I had spent the better part of a decade uh, in the contemporary Christian music business. And once that was over, uh, my husband and I started attending a church right in the heart of Middle Tennessee here in the Bible Belt. We loved this church. It was an evangelical, non-denominational church. Uh, it had the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creeds up on their website. And um, after attending there for about eight months, uh, the pastor invited me to be a part of what he described to be an inner circle type study and discussion group. And he said, if you go to this, this class, you'll come out on the other side with a seminary level education. And of course, because I, I hadn't really studied the intellectual side of my faith up to that point, that sounded really exciting to me. But what I was totally unprepared for was that in the first class, the pastor revealed to this very small group that he was actually an agnostic. He, he didn't really know what he believed about Christianity. And I would actually learn much later, even after the book came out, interestingly, that he had already by that point been through the process of deconstruction, which we can talk about. Uh, long story short, it really threw me into a faith crisis that um, I could just describe in the book like being thrown into a stormy ocean. And I had yeah. all these waves of doubt just crashing over my head and just cried out to God one night and just said, God, if you're real, if everything I've believed about you my whole life is true, I need answers for, for these claims and these questions that were brought up in this class because virtually everything that I'd ever believed about God and Jesus, and especially about the Bible, these things were picked apart. They were explained away. They were deconstructed in this class, essentially. And mm. so it, God and his faithfulness led me to the study of apologetics and, oh my goodness, so many disciplines, church history, archaeology, science, you name it, philosophy, and mm. just wow. showing me the evidence for the truthfulness of the Christian worldview. And so Today, it's my joy to really get to help other people kind of figure out what this movement of progressive Christianity is, because what ended up happening years later is that church rebranded itself and essentially took down mm. the Nicene Creed and wrote their own creed and said, we are now a progressive Christian community. And that's why that particular movement is uh, so so much my heart is to interact with it and give people language to interact with their friends and loved ones who are being persuaded by it. And and if you're listening to this, you you may have heard some of those words like deconstruct and reconstruct and progressive Christianity. But I, let's kind of define terms because I think that so many uh, and we'll, we'll get into this a little later. But so many of uh, it's a game. It's a word game. It's like the definitions of words kind of subtly change, and you almost have to define terms every time you talk about some of these sticky cultural issues, as we're doing in this elephant in the room. But let's talk about that phrase, progressive Christianity, because I know people people do not come to that word progressive neutrally. Um, and even a couple weeks ago, I think I mentioned in our call before about how um, I posted on Facebook a while back, um, what comes to mind when you think of progressive Christianity? And the responses were so divided. You know, some people, they said, well, that's 
anti-Bible. It's uh, basically throwing out the historic truths of Christianity. And other people said, well, why, why would we not want to be progressive? And so can you help us understand uh, the term a little bit better and kind of what you mean when you say progressive Christianity and, and maybe why, why this is something that's kind of dangerous to you? But we'll start with the, the term. Is it, is it the best label for what we're talking about today? Right. And that's a really, really important question, right? Because you're right. People, we could actually be talking about two completely different things and then end up talking past each other and people might get hurt feelings because we're working from different definitions, right? So yeah. the the term progressive Christianity, just kind of to lay a foundation, this is not something I came up with. This is not something that conservative Christians or, you know, historic Christians came up with as a derogatory term or anything like that. This is actually a, a term that was, that came, that came out of the movement itself. So this is what progressive Christians call themselves. This is what they have identified as the movement that they represent. So with that said, though, it's, there, it's, it's very hard to define and the reason it's hard to define is because progressive Christianity just doesn't really work like historic Christianity does. And what I mean by that is, historically speaking, Christians have been creedal. So there have been these sort of core beliefs that unite us, that that's how we know we're on the same page. We believe the same mm. essential things, right? We're not talking about secondary issues or even third or fourth tier issues, but core gospel essential issues, issues and topics and beliefs that affect our salvation. And so what a lot of Christians are under the, I think the misunderstanding after I studied the movement, I think it's a misunderstanding to say that progressive Christians are just a group of Christians who might be embracing more grace in their lives or might be changing their minds on some political issues or something like that. It's really, really so much more than that. The movement itself, as it manifests in the thought leaders, the books that are being written, the conferences that are being held, uh, it is, is a movement of people that are calling it Christianity, but ultimately they're reinterpreting and often rejecting core those core essential doctrines that define christianity and make it unique in the world and so it's really important though that we that we i want to address what what that one person had said like well don't we want to be progressive and right. uh i would say yes i mean i think we i want to progress as a christian in my understanding of the word of God. I want to grow Absolutely. and mature in, in my life and my understanding of the eternal truths of God's word. But this is kind of where the definition of progressive Christianity will come in and become so important. There's a difference between me progressing in my understanding of objective truths that don't change. And then there's a difference between that and then thinking that those objective truths are actually a little bit more fluid and can kind of change along time. So a, a, one definition or one possible way of looking at progressive Christianity would be um, to to see Christianity itself as something that's sort of fluid and changing and progressing. So uh, mm. in progressive Christianity, we might look back at the earliest people, the ones that walked with Jesus, the eyewitnesses of his life, death and resurrection in progressive Christianity. Those people are going to be seen as the baby Christians, the ones that represent Christianity in its infancy, kind of like a baby that's learning to crawl before it walks. But now as we evolve and we learn more about God, we can even make corrections on things that biblical writers said or, or did or wrote down. Whereas historically speaking, we actually, according to the, the definition of Christianity as it's held for 2000 years, those guys actually have the highest authority to tell us what Christianity is. This is one of the reasons that the writings of the apostles are canonized as scripture for us in the New Testament. So it's just a, it's a completely different way to approach Christianity. Yeah. And, and I think to that point, um, I assume that's why you titled your book, Another Gospel, uh, because progressive Christianity isn't just, you know, like the kind of progressing that we all should want to do to grow and understand and love people more deeply and look more like Christ. This is actually throwing out the historic core teachings of Christianity uh, in exchange for something else. And I, I want to read this quote that you wrote, and I think it it's, it's, uh, kind of defines uh, this book, but it says, Progressive Christianity is not simply a shift in the Christian view of social issues. It's not simply permission to embrace messiness and authenticity in the Christian life. 
It is not simply a response to doubt, legalism, abuse, or hypocrisy. It's an entirely different religion with another Jesus and another gospel. And of course, I, I assume that you were pointing to the Galatians passage where Paul, uh, there's a, uh, 2 Corinthians um, 8 and uh, Galatians uh, 1 where Paul refers to, he just says, I'm astonished how some of you are departing from what we taught you and embracing another gospel, another Jesus, receiving another spirit. And so uh, it, uh, could you talk a little bit about why you feel the need to characterize that so strongly? Because I think that is a really strong characterization. Um, and maybe, maybe the same, it's the same way of asking, uh, what, are some of the, um, what are some of the dangers in this as we get into some of its, its beliefs? Yeah, I think that's a good, that's an important question because, and, and let me clarify one thing before I get into that. When I'm analyzing the movement of progressive Christianity, it's really important who I am talking about and who I'm not talking about. Yeah. So I analyze the movement based on the thought leaders that are writing the books, holding the conferences, that are leading the movement. I certainly don't think that absolutely everybody who might say, hey, yeah, I'm a progressive Christian, that they're believing a different gospel. I don't, I'd have to ask them. I don't know what they're believing. But absolutely. as far as, you know, this is what the thought leaders are putting forth. And so um, th this is the thing that... Um, to help people kind of understand it a little bit more and maybe understand the dangers of it is because progressive Christianity is so fluid and because there is a broad spectrum of beliefs that fall under that umbrella. Like for example, you might have one progressive thought leader that believes Jesus was physically raised from the dead, but you might have another one who thinks it was more of a metaphor or maybe it didn't, you know, it didn't really happen in the physical realm. But they're, they're perfectly happy to be in unity together because in progressive Christianity, it just it's not as important what you affirm or what you would believe about God or Jesus or the Bible. But as I investigated the movement um, after I was you know reading all their books and listening to their podcasts and really just trying to figure out what unites progressive Christians, what became clear is that although they're very, uh, it's very diverse, what beliefs you might find. They're very united in what they would deny about historic Christianity. And mm -hmm. so that's, I think, the danger is that you have um, the progressive gospel ultimately is a gospel that will tell you your sin doesn't separate you from God. Like you don't mm -hmm. actually need to quote unquote, get saved. You just need to realize that you are already inherently loved by God, that you're already inherently united with God. And so all the dominoes along the narrative arc of the gospel start to fall when you start with that foundation. And so mm. ultimately progressive Christianity is going to be very universalistic. It's going, you know, there, there will be a lot of different views about what heaven is going to be, but there's going to be almost universal agreement that there is not going to be a place called hell. Yeah, I, I think it's a good way to just set it up and preface it. Um, and uh, that's a good segue into kind of what I wanted to talk about is just nailing down some of those things that progressive Christians actually reject and they are united in their rejection. And I think in the book, you kind of outline three main areas. I don't think these are the only areas, but I think they're kind of encompassing um, areas of the theology. And you say the Bible, the, the, the Bible, the cross, and the gospel. And so uh, with L Legacy Christian Church, you know, our, our big thing is we are a biblical community living the word. And so we want to do things in Bible ways. We want to teach God's word every week. And we really believe in the power of God's word, the authority of God's word. When it comes to the Bible, um, what are some of the things you'll hear progressives say when they talk about the Bible? Right. So one thing that is probably, this is the foundation for everything, right? Is if, if you view the Bible in its entirety from Genesis to Revelation as the inspired authoritative word of God, um, that's going to inform what you think about God, how you pray, how you live, what you think salvation is, what you think the gospel is. And it's really important to understand that the approach to the Bible in progressive Christianity is just radically different than it has been in historic Christianity. So you will hear progressive thought leaders say things like, hey, I, I hold the Bible in very high esteem. I have a very high view of scripture. I, they'll even, a lot of progressives will say they believe the Bible is divinely inspired. 
but there aren't a lot of progressive thought leaders that will uh, say that it's authoritative, meaning mm. we are compelled to obey it from Genesis to Revelation. And the reason for that is because the scriptures are viewed more like um, uh, Brian McLaren, a leader in the movement, referred to them like fossils. You know, you dig them up, you dust them off, you can analyze and understand what the ancient Israelites might have thought about God in the time and place that that they lived in. Or, you know, the Apostle Paul and Peter, they were just writing their best understandings of gods in, in the time and places which they lived. But as Christianity progresses, we've come, according to McLaren again, we've come to a higher and wiser view of God. So that's why, in, you know, what you might hear a progressive say about the scripture is you might hear a progressive Christian say, hey, you know, Paul had these biases against women and that's why he wrote what he did about women being silent or Paul had, maybe he, Paul had these sexual hangups and I've even heard progressives say maybe Paul was gay and that's why he <laughs> talked about sexuality so much but we can we can kind of analyze Paul and we can like Paul and we can be you know uh, we we can learn some things from Paul but ultimately Paul's not authoritative so so we go with what the spirit is revealing to us today and we can make corrections on Paul in fact it, it, on a relevant point just last week uh there was a progressive christian pastor on facebook who said uh Paul was a great kindergartner but he was a terrible professor and uh wow. that's yeah that's the approach it's like you know we we can yeah. kind of look at Paul and have compassion on where Paul was at in his life and he made a great first stage Christian, but we've we've come so much further now and we understand more now. So so that's really important to understand the progressive yeah. approach to the Bible. They're going to use words like inspired. They're going to use words like um, it. The, I, I don't know a lot of thought leaders in the progressive movement that would say the entire Bible is God's word always. But, you know, God can reveal his word to you through it sometimes. But there's just a lowered view generally of the Bible. Yeah, and I think uh, I, it might have been you that said it, but I've listened to a couple interviews about people talking about progressive Christianity in the Bible, and uh, one of the big things is that uh, th that progressive theology will be will view the Bible as a more of a they'll emphasize the human side of the Bible rather than the God inspired side. Would you would you say that that's pretty accurate? Yeah, that's honestly, I used a whole bunch of words to kind of that. That's exactly, I think, the most succinct way to put it. In fact, on my podcast, I interviewed a guy who had deconstructed into progressive Christianity and then was discipled by a local pastor back to historic Christianity. It was a great story. But mm. he said it just like that. He said, when I was a progressive Christian, I thought that the Bible was a human book about God rather than a divine book written to humans. You know, you said something about, and, and maybe you quoted it in the book, but here's a, here's a quote. Um, but I, I've, hear, I've heard people say the Bible was written a long time ago by people who were just trying their best to understand who God is. And now we know better, kind of what you just said. And you referred to C.S. Lewis's line called chronological snobbery where it's like modern people looking back on ancient texts with kind of an infantile attitude or a, a degrading attitude. And uh, the, the heading you use in the book is limited. So progressives view the Bible as limited. Um, and you've already kind of talked about what you mean by that, but what are some good responses um, to that kind of, uh, those kind of accusations against scripture? I think the most, if you're having a conversation with somebody who might be buying into some of these ideas, I think the best way to approach it is go, to go to Jesus. And there's a couple of reasons for that. As we've kind of discussed already, a lot of progressives, they like Jesus, but they don't really like Paul. So quoting the Apostle Paul is probably not going to get you very far um, because they don't view Paul really as authoritative. Now, some progressives, certainly not all, but some will view the four gospels as having a higher authority than the rest of, of the scriptures. So you mm -hmm. have Jesus, the, you know, you have the words of Jesus, or at least if you can get, get your progressive friend to agree that you at least have some of the words of Jesus, we can at least know some things about Jesus from the gospels. And then you go to what Jesus said. And a great question to ask is, you know, what do you think about what Jesus said about the scriptures? Because the scriptures that Jesus was quoting from, is the same books of the Old Testament that we have today. Uh, the canon was largely settled by the time of Jesus. I think there were still some disputes over Esther and some of the wisdom literature, but certainly the law and the prophets, 
this was canon by Jesus' day. And he quoted from the Old Testament scriptures and over and over and over again, he refers to them as the word of God, the commandments of God. Never does he approach the scriptures as it, them being anything but the breathed out word of God. He never says, you know, these these people that were just, they were just doing their best to figure God out. And, you know, we, we've come to a higher view now. I mean, he never does that. So the, the living word has no problem or contradiction with the written word. In fact, Jesus appeals to the authority of the scriptures to fight temptation in the wilderness. I, I mean, sometimes I just yeah. stop to think about that. And that's so powerful. I mean, he is God. He could have called down a legion of angels to fight temptation, but he uses the authority of the scriptures to essentially end that conversation. And so mm. I think that you just may be asking, what do you think about what Jesus, how he seemed to talk about the scriptures versus how a lot of progressives talk about the scriptures? Yeah. And I, I know our pastor, Reggie, he talks about that a lot. Like what, if you're going to say you follow Jesus then you also have to follow Jesus's own view of scripture, uh, which, you know, seems to be a lot more than just, it was a human document that we no longer have to listen to. And Jesus did say, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so, you know, I, that, that's kind of an interesting um, chain of thought with all this is, is it does seem that there is a progression in the old Testament. Um, like, you know, we're not, we're not going around following all the ceremonial laws in Leviticus anymore. And so there, there was a progression, um, but it, it seems like that somehow culminated or was fulfilled in Christ. And it seems like progressives want to, want to keep going. Like we need to keep moving beyond Jesus to something else. Um, and I think that's kind of what Paul was getting at in those verses when he talks about um, the, the Galatians or the Corinthians abandoning the teaching and moving on to something else. And so I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this tendency, uh, a little bit more about the tendency to pit Jesus against the Bible in progressive Christianity, because that's, that's kind of mind blowing to me. Um, but it seems like there's a tendency to make those two oppositional to one another. Um, I mean, would you agree with that? Uh, why do you think that is, I guess? And you may have already answered a little bit of it, but I'm just curious. No, no, that's that's a really insightful observation because, yeah, I, I agree 100%. That is a very common theme you'll see in the progressive Christian movement. And so how it will manifest is um, often you'll hear a progressive say or maybe write a blog post about how evangelicals or historic Christians you know, they worship the Bible. It's bibliolatry. It's they're mm. they're putting the Bible above God and above Jesus, and essentially they're worshiping the Bible. And so mm -hmm. in the mind of the progressive, if you view the Bible as authoritative, you're worshiping it. You're putting it on a level that's way higher than it's intended to be put to put on. And so then they'll say, you know, Jesus was the word. He is the logos. He is the the revealed word of God. And so therefore, you know, Jesus should be the authority, not the Bible. But the problem with that is that there's no contradiction there. There, you, Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. And the living word appealed to the written word over and over and over again in his lifetime to, to talk to the Pharisees. To I mean, it was just constantly in his mouth. And if we understand that Jesus is the author of Scripture, it's his word, right? There's no, there's no contradiction between the living word and the written word. And if we do have that view that, you know, it's it's Jesus, not the written word, well, then, the, then this leads us to a very big logical problem. Like, well, then how do we know what Jesus said? And if right. you don't use the Bible as your authoritative source for the words of Jesus, then essentially you're going to be following some kind of inner moral compass or some mystical kind of Jesus sense that you get inside of your own soul. And uh, that can lead to all kinds of, of terrible theology and, and bad ideas because, if we don't have an authoritative standard outside of ourselves, we're not going to know if that voice is telling the truth or not, or if it's just our own fallen nature, uh, you know, wanting what the heart wants or something along those lines. So um, I don't see any contradiction between the two. And I think it's an unfair charge to say that if a Christian views the Bible as authoritative, that they're worshiping it. I, I've never been confused about that. I've never worshiped the Bible. Um, I worship God. And because I worship God, I revere his revealed word to me as being having the utmost authority to get to tell me what I need to know about him. Yeah, I, th I think that's huge. And uh, 
You, you know, you mentioned the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, and you know, I, I've thought a lot about that over the years, and it's interesting that that battle between Jesus and Satan in Matthew chapter four and other places, uh, when he keeps saying, he responds by, "It is written, it is written, it is written." Um, that that's really a battle over the interpretation of Scripture, because Satan Satan knows the Scriptures. And he's throwing these scriptures at Jesus, and uh, Jesus, because of his full understanding of God's revealed word, he's able to offer a correct interpretation. And so, um, I, I do want to wade a little bit into hermeneutics. And by hermeneutics, uh, hermeneutics is a theological word that just means um, how you read a text. Um, and there's different types of hermeneutics. But, um, you know, that there's one that's really, po- there's a way of reading the Bible that's really popular that I'm sure you've heard about. And it's this redemptive arc hermeneutic where, and it's similar to kind of what you talked about before about how, well, in the Old Testament, it said this, but uh, we've now progressed. Or I know Paul said this in Ephesians 5, or Paul said this in this passage, but uh, that was for that time and that culture. And our culture is different. So we have to kind of, we have to like... We have to follow the arc of where we see Scripture. I mean, do you see problems with that kind of hermeneutic? And is there maybe a better hermeneutic or a better way that we need to read the Bible? And and how does that maybe undermine biblical authority, I guess? Well, so what you've just described really requires a very subjective uh, approach to Scripture. It's really... um, requires it would require somebody to basically go by their feelings like what feels more redemptive what feels like something i would do and then maybe i'll follow that arc um and and the danger of that of course is that we run the risk of creating a god that looks a whole lot like what we see in the mirror right and so we can take any kind of what we might call problematic passages of the old testament and we can explain those away as just god accommodating to the culture or god just allowing the Israelites to do things in his name because that was the best that they could, the, the best understanding that they had at the time. And so that was God being patient with them or something. And I can understand certainly why that sounds really appealing. I mean, that that is an appealing way to read scripture because yeah. then you don't really have to wrestle real hard with some of the, the acts of judgment that we see God engage in in the Old Testament. But the reason those are important is because they reveal God's attitude towards sin. And we need to understand that God hates sin and how he feels about sin and how what is his response to sin. Because what yeah. that does is that sets up for us the beauty of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That sets up for us the, mm. the incredible mercy of God, the love of God to provide a way for that, that you know chasm to be bridged through Jesus. And I think ultimately what it really comes down to, and and this is something we haven't really hit on yet, uh, but that's just, that message of the gospel is going to be beautiful to someone if they know they're a sinner. But if they don't really think that they need that, then yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, would be a lot of unnecessary stuff going on if you didn't actually think you really needed a God of judgment or a God that could bring salvation in his mercy to you. And so that, you know, that's sort of a whole other, other topic I've just opened up there, but As far as hermeneutics go, I think it's key that we understand what God said and what he meant, because it can't mean something Mm. different to us than it meant to the original audience. And I love that you brought up the battle over interpretation with Jesus in the wilderness, but even think about Jesus with the Pharisees. Jesus was quoting Old Testament scriptures that were 1400 years old by the time that he quoted them to the Pharisees. And there's no sense in which Jesus says, you know, hey, we need to understand this in a new light now that 1400 years have passed. No. In fact, he said, I didn't come to abolish the word. I came to fulfill it. And so there's Jesus attitude toward those at his even in his day, ancient scriptures was that he expected the Pharisees to know what God said and also what he meant. That wasn't up for debate that that somehow the meaning or the interpretation had changed uh, because of culture. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think uh, the the other thing you brought up in the book was similar to the hermeneutics thing. Um, you know, there's people that will say, well, God, the God of the Old Testament is so violent, and why would he ever command God to kill women and children? 
Um, but then a fuller understanding of the context and the history makes you realize, well, Jericho, I think you mentioned Jericho is a military outpost. There probably was very little, very few women and children there. And that doesn't, that doesn't solve the problem. Like it's supposed, we're supposed to struggle with it, right? It's supposed to be a severe judgment type passage, but it doesn't solve it completely, but it's way different than saying God went and murdered a bunch of kids. Um, you know, and I just think that's, uh, it's just an example of the ways that scripture sometimes gets misused, misused and carelessly, uh, basically proof texted to prop up modern attacks against evangelicalism, which is a whole nother, um, topic, but you brought up the cross. Uh, and so let's get into that because I think that's pretty huge. The progressive view of the cross. Um, there, uh, here, I'll, I'll just, here's what you write in the book. This is a quote and we'll probably put it, put it up on the screen. Despite the abundance of biblical testimony, the one thing that virtually all progressive Christian thought leaders agree on is that Jesus did not die to pay the penalty for our sin. He was crucified by an angry mob for speaking truth to power. And his love and forgiveness towards those who killed him is the example we all should follow. According to progressive Christians, Jesus didn't need to die, but he submitted himself to the will of the people. According to their wisdom, the historic view makes God nothing more than an abusive father. So I want to talk a little bit about um, progressive, the progressive rejection of penal substitutionary atonement. And I know you've talked about this many times on your podcast, but why, uh, and to, to clarify, penal substitutionary atonement is just simply the view that Jesus died to pay the price for our sin and to satisfy the wrath of God. Uh, it's a substitutionary death. And so progressive Christians will say, yeah, Jesus uh, died on the cross for my sins. But when you kind of nail into what they actually believe, they'll definitely avoid any mention of a substitute, um, they, they seem to be, uh, that ideology seems to be allergic to that. Uh, why do you think that is? And how would you kind of characterize that for those who haven't read your book or are just kind of being introduced to this? Yeah. So, you know, the Bible has lots of different ways of talking about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. These are sometimes referred to as theories of atonement. I don't like calling them theories of atonement because it, it makes it sound like, oh, just pick one and that'll be the view you hold to. As Christians, we should hold to everything that the Bible says about what Jesus accomplished on the cross. And there's ransom language. There's uh, The Bible talks about Jesus dying and rising to defeat the power of sin and death, and praise God, he did. But the one, there's one way that the scripture talks about it that's roundly rejected, as you've mentioned, the penal substitutionary atonement. And honestly, even just in a broader sense, if you leave the, the punishment part out, the penal part out, even just any kind of broad sense of substitutionary atonement hmm. is rejected in the progressive church. So I don't know a lot of progressive Christians who would say Jesus died for my sins. In fact, you can find articles written by progressives that say Jesus did not die for your sins like that. That's just a mis that's a misunderstanding of what was going on. Now, the ones who will say it mean something entirely different than historically Christians have meant. They more mean he died because of my sin or he died because people were sinful and they killed him. Um, but ultimately speaking, when we talk about a substitutionary atonement, we're talking about a sacrificial death. As you mentioned, I think you characterized it well. There's penal substitutionary atonement, which has to do with Jesus taking the punishment of our sin. And there, then there's Anselm's uh, satisfaction theory, which brings in the uh, satisfaction of the wrath of God. It all works together. It's all over the Bible. It's all over scripture. But right. this is just the idea that God the Father would require the blood sacrifice of his only son. In the mind of the progressive Christian, this implicates the moral character of God, turning him into a cosmic child abuser. And so that's why penal substitutionary atonement is often referred to as cosmic child abuse in the progressive movement. And I think the, the the why, I think why it's rejected is because it in the mind of the progressive, it turns God into some kind of a monster that they can't reconcile, at least in their own minds. Um, mm. But again, if you don't think you're a sinner, if you don't think you need that in the first place, then that might make a little bit of sense. But if you know that you're a sinner that deserves God's wrath, if you know you deserve death and hell, and yet God provided this way to be reconciled to him, then it becomes a very beautiful teaching. Hmm. Yeah. And, and I think part of this is what you mentioned about sin. Like 
if you don't think you're a sinner, then you're not going to see the necessity of a blood sacrifice. And so I think there, there seems to be an allergy, an emotional allergy to talking about any kind of sin or personal sin, except, you know, there, um, yeah, so, so let's talk about that a little bit because now we're kind, of, we're kind of bleeding into the next, um, to, to the gospel. So we talked about the Bible and the cross and the gospel, but uh, when we talk about the heart of the Christian message, the good news of what Jesus did to save us, um, it seems like, according to the biblical gospel, we've got the four elements of creation, fall, restoration, redemption, and our core problem is sin, and the core solution is, is trusting in Jesus and what he did for us on the cross, the historic death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, but you say progressives have a different gospel. And so if we're thinking on a worldview level, those elements of worldview, you have the basic human problem, the basic human solution, um, what is the basic human problem, according to progressives, if, if our sin doesn't require a savior, um, what is the basic problem of all of life? What is the basic solution? And what is the ultimate destiny um, for the progressive Christian? Yeah, so one thing you'll observe if you read very far into the progressive movement is that uh, the core problem is going to run along the lines of what the core problem would be. Now, I'm not saying that progressive Christianity is Marxist, but very similar core problems that you're going to see trickle down from like the critical social justice movement that we see. And I want to be really careful how I word that, because as Christians, we want to pursue justice. Um, justice is very important. It's an attribute of God. It's it's part of his nature and character. But biblically speaking, justice is is who god is it's his moral perfection so anything that falls short of that is an injustice and we have to start there as christians before we even think about how that's going to spread out to you know between people groups or anything like that it has to start with the nature and character of god but in progressive christianity i mean you might say in in one sense that the great problem is what they would call injustice but the definition of that justice is going to be more along the lines of critical social theories and Marxism, which would be not so much the perfect moral character of God, but really any kind of unequal outcome. Now, lest anyone think I'm going into economics or something, um, think about how that would apply across anything. So in progressive Christianity, injustice is the problem. And that's what needs to be righted through activism, through marching in the right you know, protests through uh, the right, you know, saying the right things on Twitter, uh, uh, th these kinds of things, the activism that you're doing to bring an equal outcome to all people. Now, it, you know, sure, that has applications in economics, it has applications in other things, but you can't just keep them there. Because if you if you just take a practical example of what that might look like, take, for example, a church who I would agree with saying women have different roles to play in the church and in the home, uh, equal in value and, and worth to men, men and women, equal in, in dignity, value and worth, different roles to play in the church and in the home. I would, I think that's biblical. I think that's beautiful. But in the mind of the progressive, that's not just something they might disagree with. That's an actual injustice because women don't have the exact same outcome as men. Trickle that down to mm. sexuality. You know, if, if a, a church says a heterosexual couple can be married in God's eyes, but they they deny that to uh, homosexual couples, then in the mind of the pro progressive, that's an injustice. So those are the types of quote unquote wrongs that need to be righted in the progressive movement, largely through activism. So it's not uh, the sinful nature that you have. That's the core problem. It's the injustices that manifest in culture through systems and, and these types of things, which is going, it's going to run the the identification of what is just and unjust is going to be in line with culture. Yeah. And uh, since you brought it up, um, I think, you know, we, we have talked about this at Legacy before. We did a sermon a couple years ago on critical theory. And, you know, I, I think most people haven't thought a ton about this, but uh, why is, uh, why has Marxism, you mentioned Marxism. Um, can you just kind of explain how that's infiltrated um, just our view of biblical justice? And, and for those of you who don't kind of know, so Mar Marxism, Karl Marx, uh, the R Russian Revolution, uh, the Communist Manifesto, it was basically, uh, it's all about separating people into groups and you have the rich and the poor. In, in Russia, it was class warfare. 
but uh, what we're seeing now is kind of Marxism in a different flavor. And I, you know, people use all this words. We're not trying to equip everyone with weapons to use against anything that makes them uncomfortable or disagree with, right? Uh, but what you're seeing now is kind of more of a cultural form of the class form or the, the uh, social status form in Russia, uh, where it's like all these different groups. So you separate everyone into either oppressed or oppressor categories. And so you have men and women, and men are the oppressors and women are the oppressed. And then you have LGBTQ community and heterosexuality. You have uh, all these different, they call them social binaries. You have uh, disabled people and able-bodied people. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about, do, do you feel like progressive Christianity um, is, is pretty heavily influenced by that? Or is that just a conservative boogeyman that gets thrown out as kind of an unnecessary, uh, as an excuse to not wade into sticky issues, or, or maybe is it a little bit of both? Does yeah, I think sense? it can. Yeah, I think it can be. I yeah. want to be fair here because it can be. Um, it, it, a Christian might uh, have a, let's say, go to church and they do a sermon about reconciliation, you know, and it has to do with race. And then they think, oh, because they've done that. Oh, that's critical theory. That's, you know, that's and that in that sense, it could be a boogeyman because I don't know, maybe that was a biblical sermon talking about um, yeah. how we should relate with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that it can be. But um, I also think it's a very real problem because it's it's becoming the dominant worldview of our culture. And so, you know, you mentioned Marx. I'd love to, if I could, not to get too deep in the water, yeah. but I'd love to throw a couple well, more names in there. If you do get too deep, we'll just edit it out in post-production. <laughs> I love it. I do want to add a couple of names to the list because I think this yeah. is really important for people to understand. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to give a term postmodernism. Okay. Some people yeah. might have an understanding of what that is. It's okay. If you don't, the, the main way to think about postmodernism is a whole lot more we could say about it, but it's ultimately how it manifests is the idea of, you know, what's true for you is true for you. And what's true for me is true for me. So when you, when you look at the history of postmodernism, it really goes back to the sixties. And I want to bring up a couple of philosophers because I think they're, they're yeah. important. Um, because it, they work in line with Marxist ideas. And so that would be Michel Foucault, who is probably considered one of the most well-known postmodern philosophers, but but even more so, a guy named Jacques Derrida. So Jacques Derrida is referred to as the father of deconstruction. Now for Derrida, and this is where, this, I'm going to try to tie this together with progressive Christianity. For Derrida, yeah. um, it had to do with words. So text, he didn't believe words could be pinned down to singular meanings. So therefore the intent of the author had no more authority to say what the text means than the interpretation of the hearer. Now you can already see how that even just the deconstruction of text is made its way into our culture as it's kind of, you know, because he also was in that postmodern movement. Um, and then also for, for Derrida, it was, you, you look for what's not being said. So almost like an extreme version of read between the lines. You're going to analyze the power dynamics of the people writing the thing and maybe look at look at the narrative they're trying to get you to see, but you look at it from a different aspect to try to get into it from a different way. And so so that was present. But then there was a guy named John Caputo who wrote a book called What Would Jesus Deconstruct? And he applied the deconstruction that Derrida had brought as far as words go, and he applied it to Christianity. And so this is where the deconstruction movement and the progressive Christian movement are really going to intersect. Um, you can you can go back mm -hmm. and listen to episodes of the Deconstructionist podcast where they're interviewing John Caputo. He's very influential, but not very well known. But he he took that deconstructionism and applied it to religion. So according to Caputo, Christianity is sort of progressing, right? You can see where this is kind of flowered out. In, yeah. To the point where he even said, hey, if Jesus was alive today, he would affirm the cultural sexual ethic because he would look around and see that it's good for people. And he would actually, according to Caputo, disagree with the scriptures and he would affirm. And so, mm -hmm. so this is hugely influential, but it's all coming from this sort of postmodernism that flowered out in the 60s. That was largely a redefinition of truth, right? Truth was in, especially when it comes to morality and religion, truth was no more, it wasn't viewed as fixed or objective. It was more viewed as like something that's relative to each person. 
And so that's why today you're considered judgmental. If you tell somebody that morally they're doing something wrong or, um, or, or their religion is wrong, like those are, those are fighting words today because those yeah. categories, that's all been recategorized because of postmodernism as far as religion and morality, that's just kind of like, you do what works for you and I'll do what works for me, but we're not going to tell each other we're wrong. And so all of this, I think, has really informed the movement of progressive Christianity that wants to keep the label Christian, but really put it in this real subjective kind of flowy, fluid, personally subjective and relative kind of area, if that makes yeah. sense. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I was kind of curious. I again, I don't know. It's it's a whole can of worms and a rabbit trail with the postmodern philosophers and the Frankfurt School. And but I, I wonder if you've read. Have you read Carl Truman's book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self? Um, this book is amazing, and I've actually I actually recommended. Um, if anyone listening, if you were with us a couple weeks ago, I think I recommended the abridged version called Strange New World. Um, and it's a very, it's easier to understand. Um, that first one is very dense, but yeah, the second yeah. one, the abridged version is very good. And, you know, one of the philosophers he talks about in there is Philip Reif, um, who wrote a lot. He was, a, I think he was a believer who wrote a lot about, um, the, the, uh, the intersection of psychology and faith after Freud and you know one of the one of the ways he characterizes our world he says we kind of live in a third world culture and he doesn't mean that in the socioeconomic sense he means that in the in the sense that cultures of the past there they existed to transmit uh external values onto the next generation and so the locus of meaning was external and so you you discovered your morality from external and then our culture exists uh, to the only the only reason it exists is to repudiate the cultures of the past and to reject any impositions externally and so the locus of meaning is now from within um, you know and it, it has to do with like he talks in the book as you know about uh, Freud and, and Marx and the sexual revol revolution and kind of the intersection of all those things um, but I do I, I do think you're right I think that's a, just such a dominant narrative and I think if we could help Christians put a name to that or just kind of identify the worldviews at play under the surface, they're really not hard to refute is the weird thing. But I just don't think many people are aware. Uh, they just kind of hear these things that sound good, uh, but are, are kind of difficult to refute in the moment. And so I, I want to shift gears a little bit um, because I do... Uh, and we may we may get more into the critical theory conversation in a bit, but I, I wanted to ask you. I, I loved how in your book um, you kind of return to the historic teachings of Christianity, and you quote from the early church fathers. Um, uh, I, I wonder, can you help us understand why that that's helpful um, when it comes to progressive Christianity? Why is it helpful to look at the teachings of the early church fathers? Well, I think um, it's 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 helpful and it's important um, because, well, for me, it was when I was trying to figure out what Christianity is. And so when I yeah. was in my faith crisis, I wanted to make sure that if I had be, if I were to become persuaded that Christianity was false, I wanted to make sure I was rejecting the real thing or accepting the real thing. So so that was kind mm -hmm. of one of the early things I did was go back into the earliest church fathers reading, you know, everywhere, everyone from Clement up through, um, you know, Justin uh, Martyr and and th through Augustine and and all of that kind of going through through church history, just to kind of see like what's the thread, what's the, am I just off the rails over here doing this thing and these guys were over here doing this, and um, I was astounded to discover the common core. That no, you know, like when when I was in my faith crisis and God kind of reconstructed, I made a lot of course corrections, certainly along the way. Um, but that core was there. I had been given the, the real gospel by my parents and by the, the churches that I grew up in. And reading the church fathers was hugely informative. Now, now the church fathers are not infallible. They were right. they were not inspired like on the level of the apostles when they wrote scripture. But it's such a great picture into what was passed down and what was, you know, passed down through history. And what you're going to find is that core, that gospel message. And um, that was what was so 
not just astounding and astonishing to me, but exciting to me. When I read yeah. St. Augustine and I'm I'm reading, I mean, all of the things, even back in the fifth century, Augustine is refuting half the things that were brought up in this class. And I mean, I'm yeah. just thinking, how is that, how is that possible that he could have refuted this stuff? But and that's because, you know, of course there's nothing new under the sun. But um, yeah. but yeah, it was just hugely encouraging to me as a Christian. And I think it's it's really good to read that early stuff to even as a, to take a temperature of how influenced we are by our current culture. And I, I kind of will go back to those guys sometimes for that purpose. Yeah. And it, it's kind of interesting to know it for two reasons. Number one, we study historic Christianity because it gives us confidence that the faith we received has been passed on for 2000 years and people have paid, paid an ultimate price even in some eras uh, to give that to us. So that's a gift we should protect, but also to realize that some of these th teachings that are presented as fresh and new uh, within progressive Christianity are really just old heresies that have been refuted a hundred times. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, uh, along with that, um, you mentioned three groups in the book. You mentioned the Judaizers, um, the Gnostics, and the Marcionites. Um, can you just kind of quickly show the similarities between those three groups and kind of what, because I've even said, we, we've talked about how um, a lot of things that we see in the progressive movement are kind of a new kind of Gnosticism, where it's like you, you have to achieve the hidden knowledge in order to, in order to be, and you know, kind of, I, I hate the word because again, it gets weaponized unnecessarily, but like woke like unless unless you're woke, then you don't really see reality, or unless you identify the hidden power relationships behind every interaction or every institution, then you're not really woke. And some of those things kind of remind me of what the Gnostics used to teach. And so I wonder if you could just spell that out for people that are listening. The, those three groups: Judaizers, Gnostics, and Marcionites. Yeah. So the Judaizers, interestingly, probably the first heresy in church history, at least the first recorded one. <laughs> And that's when it was a group of Jewish Christians that were teaching the Gentile believers that they had to become Jews before they could become Christians. Um, and, you know, of course, Paul was so opposed to this and he would get even, you know, he got really worked up about it, even just saying, you know, no, this is this is not a gospel of works. It's it's grace that saves you. And Paul was so insistent on that. But the Judaizers, of course, wanted people to have to go through the rites of Judaism first in order to receive the gospel. And I think where that would really, and certainly I'm not saying with any of these groups that progressive Christianity is exactly like that, but there are some very similar things in that with the Judaizers, mm. it was about what you had to do in the outward sense. It was about the works. And I do see yeah. that in progressive Christianity. It's it's really about the activism. It's about the social justice work you're doing. It's about you know the causes that you're advocating for. That's really the, what's considered the highest level of virtue, virtue. And really it's I mean, I can't say it in a theological sense, it's salvific and that it's what saves you in the progressive church, but it kind of is. It's kind of the manifestation mm, yeah. of the gospel in the mind of the progressive. And then Gnosticism was a tangly beast. There's um, yeah. there were lots of different sects of Gnostics that believed lots of different things. Um, but but one of the, the biggest manifestations of Gnosticism was what you alluded to before was that what saves you is knowledge, right? It's this kind of secret knowledge that just a few people had access to, and that was what what would save you. And and so I think there's a similarity there in progressive Christianity that it's like this great awakening that you have, this almost shift of your consciousness when you shift out of this sin and redemption narrative and into this all encompassing, you know, whatever it might be to that particular progressive, but rejecting mm. that sort of old fashioned view of sin and redemption, and that's just kind of the kindergarten. Christianity, and we got to expand our minds and really realize that that it's something different and it's something new. So I think that that is a similarity there with Gnosticism. And then mm. the Martianites were interesting because uh, Martian didn't uh, he he basically thought now he thought that the God of the Old Testament was actually a different deity. Um, mm. Like, you know, he's the mean one. And then Jesus kind of redeems the God of the Old Testament. Well, progressives obviously aren't going to say that's an, an actually different deity, although some of the <laughs> language that they use bumps up against that where you almost mm. think that is what they're saying. Um, but yeah. they certainly would not agree 
that there that the God who who incarnated in Jesus would have done some of the things that is attributed to Yahweh in the Old Testament. In fact, there's a scholar Pete Enns who says, I mean, what we yeah. see recorded in the Old Testament is not how God is. It's just how he was thought to be. It's how he was recorded, but that is not who he actually is. So you have this really strong sense of like this this Old Testament God is really mean, but then Jesus is this totally other thing happening that redeems that whole thing. And so that's a that's I think probably of all three that might be the strongest similarity uh, to hmm. to an ancient heresy. Yeah, that's great. Uh, and you know I I, I want to kind of wrap up this uh, section um, as we finish talking about progressive Christianity. But you know I I think I think a good question to ask as we talk about all this uh, a lot of people kind of drift into progressivism based on some complaints that they have. Um, about the evangelical church or about the church. Maybe they have some church wounds. Um, and so there, there, there's complaints, right? And I, so I guess what I'm curious about is, is there any truth in some of the complaints that progressives have about social justice issues or the way the church has treated LGBTQ or other things like that or the way the church has treat, treated women? Um, you know, how do we, how do we acknowledge the danger of progressive Christianity, I guess, without being deaf and blind to some of the bits of truth that are in there. Yeah, this is a tangly beast too, because there's a lot of truth and a lot of error in it. So when progressive Christianity first came on the scene, really through the emergent church in the late nineties, early two thousands, I really agreed with a lot of the critiques they were bringing. Um, I had traveled in the contemporary Christian music industry, visited lots of different churches, Seen, seen kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so I think that's why I resonated with this group of the of people that I found at this church is because they had some of the same critiques that I had. So I think there is some validity. Of course, there have been a lot of abuse scandals. There has been hypocrisy. There's moral failing. Um, all of that stuff is, and it's yeah. probably at fever pitch right now because we have the internet and we have you know people continuing to talk about it a lot. Um, And so, yeah, I want to acknowledge that there are some very real criticisms of the church that are valid. um, And I had those. But what was so surprising to me when I was in that class at the progressive church was how quickly my classmates and even the pastor were willing to throw the gospel out along with some of that, uh, those other things. I never, when I would see maybe a a hypocritical pastor or prosperity gospel pastor, you know, hawking Uh, what are they, the prayer cloths, you know, for money, trying to cheat little old ladies out of their money. I never equated that with Jesus. You know, for me, that, that was just, that was somebody really abusing a truth, not, you know, representing that truth. And so those categories were very clear in my mind. So with that said though, where the progressive movement has, has come to is that there are platforms that are dedicated to finding the wackiest thing you can find out there on Christian Twitter or on, you know, some pastor and in, in preaching with an AR-15 on his back or something, and then pushing <laughs> that out to their social media followers. I mean, there's an account that does this. Yeah. He'll say, this is what 80% of evangelicals are supporting. And I'm just thinking, first of all, I've never heard of that guy and I don't support that. So what, but it's a narrative, it becomes a narrative. And so yeah, it's like even attacking a straw man. Yeah, it does. And so there are a lot of progressives that think that when they hear the word evangelical, that's what they think of. Um, yeah. And so now the reason I think we should retain the word evangelical, I think that even though there have been abuses and there are misrepresentations, certainly, um, I think we need to hold on to it because classically, evangelical meant a commitment to biblical authority. It meant a focus on individual salvation, the emphasis on the cross, activism, which was actually meant evangelism. And um, the Bible being God's word. And I think that the yeah. way that it emerged in history to protect historic Christianity, we need to fight for that. Now, what people hear, especially in the progressive movement now, they hear the word evangelical and they just see a MAGA hat and a gun locker, right? And so it's right. come to mean something totally yeah. different, but it only means that here. That's the thing is like the reason I think we need to fight for the word is because for our brothers and sisters all over the globe who are quote unquote evangelical, they're going on this original classic definition. And if we yield the word, 
then we're abandoning all of our brothers and sisters all over the world. And in scholarship, evangelical scholarship really means something very specific. And it doesn't mean th that the, what, you know, a lot of people are portraying it as. So there's just, a, it's, yeah. there's a lot of tangles in there. And that's why we need the Bible yeah. as our authoritative standard. I think they had a big, the Methodist church had a big convention recently where they divided over that issue of ordaining uh, LGBTQ uh, priests and all the African bishops came over and disagreed with the uh, affluent American congregations and basically challenged them because they weren't reading. They said, were we reading the same Bible? You know, just kind of, kind of interesting to your point. Um, okay. So, so two more questions kind of in this category of progressive Christianity. Uh, number one, um, how do we, how do people listening today guard against this and, and, how do we, uh, I guess, how can we, uh, how can we recognize this in the church when we brush up against these ideas? Mm. So I think that it can be overwhelming to hear all of these different ways we're talking about it and it can be overwhelming. But my encouragement to Christians is just know the real thing. If you know the real thing and you know why you believe it's the real thing, you're not going to be fooled by any kind of counterfeit when it comes across your social media newsfeed or even might be in a book you bought at a Christian bookstore. If you know the word of God and you are solid on that, you're, you will be able to spot the counterfeits however they manifest, whether it's for progressive Christianity or something else, because there's always counterfeits around. Um, so that would be my encouragement. Guard against it by knowing the word. Read the Bible. Be biblically literate. And um, that that is just huge, right? And then um, spotting it, I think you just look for language of a lower view of the Bible, um, look for gospel presentations that leave out the sin and redemption story, or the gospel being, being referred to more in a works-based uh, sort of way. Because as Christians, when we trust in Christ, we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit and we will produce fruit of works. We will produce good works in our lives, but we just have to keep it, our heads on straight about it, that it's not the works that save us. That's not the, that's not the crux of the gospel. The crux of the gospel is I'm a sinner who needs a savior and Jesus is my savior. There's the sin and redemption arc that is so important that we can't, we can't miss, right? That's gotta be yeah. where we keep our focus on. So I think just looking for, the way things are worded, the Bible, the human emphasis or the human element of the Bible being emphasized over the divine is another one. But there's little uh, little mm. things you can look for as well, for sure. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, because uh, Elisa, Elisa is has kind of stepped into this space of uh, apologetics and doubt and deconstruction. And I know many of you, uh, either you know somebody who has gone through this process or maybe even used that word of deconstruction or maybe they're struggling with doubts and questions that they have about the Bible and about Christianity. And so we just wanted to take some time to get some wisdom from Elisa on how to engage some of those topics and some of those conversations. And so, um, Elisa, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, shift gears a little bit. Your, your new book that's coming out, coming out in October, I believe, is called Live Your Truth and Other Lies. And I love the title of that book. I think I jokingly told you before. I, I, I don't. I wouldn't expect a call from Oprah to come on her show yeah. anytime soon. Not expecting it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I love. I love that uh, that title. And I think the tagline you used uh, is exposing popular lies that make us anxious, exhausted, and self obsessed. Can you share with us a little bit about what your new book is going to be about? Yeah, well, thanks for asking about that. I, you know, I, when I wrote another gospel, which was sort of like what I would describe as a theological memoir, it's just the journey of me walking through this faith crisis as a result of taking part in a, a class in a progressive Christian church or a church that would go on to become a progressive Christian church. And so that one was more theological in that I had to hit, you know, very specific points. But with Live Your Truth and Other Lies, I zoomed out a bit and I wanted to look at the influencers, those kind of self-help-ish with a Christian little veneer on it, kind of uh, social media platforms and almost these self-help gurus 
that uh, have all these kind of sloganish messages, things like you are enough, you're perfect just as you are, you're in control of your own destiny, God just wants you to be happy, you only live once. We we talk about some of these slogans, these are the popular deceptions we talk about. They're the kind of, of deceptions that actually sound good and they're the thing you kind of want to say to somebody if they're having a hard day, like if somebody's down on themselves, you want to say you are enough. But what we do in the book is we go just right under the surface and show how those things fail just on a logical level. Like, for example, if you tell somebody who's having a you know really down on themselves, struggling with how they feel about themselves, and you say, well, you are enough, essentially, we're putting the burden uh, on that person basically telling them you have to fix all of your own problems, right? You have to just find inside yourself something yeah. to make it all better. And that's really a burden. Mm. And then we go even deeper and we go into the into the Bible and we show how uh, not only do these deceptions cause a, a spiritual devastation, but then we highlight the beauty of the better message that the Bible has to tell on these topics. So it's it was a fun book to write because mm. I got to spend a lot of time in the Bible. It's very story driven as well. Yeah, no, I think that's awesome. And you you just mentioned a couple of them real quick, but um, uh, let's go back to that. What what are some common popular lies in our culture right now that you're seeing? Um, and let's start there. What what are some of the big ones? Yeah. I Probably the two biggest ones are live your truth. That's the title, right? And then you are enough. And they kind of work together because it's so popular these days to tell people you are enough, especially if they have struggled with how they view themselves or yeah. uh, even what they think kind of a thing human people are. And so by telling somebody, you know, you are enough, like I mentioned before, you're not only burdening them with basically having to fix all their own problems, but you're really taking away from them the opportunity to repent and believe the gospel because Christianity has a completely different message. Christianity doesn't say you're perfect just as you are. Uh, Christianity has this beautiful doctrine of the Imago Dei. Every single human being who's ever been born has been made in the image and likeness of God. And because of that has inherent dignity and value and worth. But then there's a big but. And the big but is what I think our culture ignores. And even in progressive Christianity, it's ignored. And the but is the fall. It's essentially when Adam and Eve rebelled against God in the garden, uh, ushering sin and death into the world. And then through Adam, death spreading to all men. And uh, we know that we have this inherently sinful nature. And I think that's the core. Mm. That's the core of where the Christian message is so countercultural because absolutely every message in culture right now is trying to convince you how perfect you already are, how beautiful you already are. You just need to dig down inside your heart and find the gold that's in there, unleash that and proclaim that to the world and have other people affirm that about you. But that's based on the assumption that what you're going to find in there is good. And so ultimately, I think the whole book is built on this idea of, do you think you're a sinner or do you not? Because if you do, it's going to send you on this path. And if you think you're not a sinner, it's going to send you on a completely different path where all of these lies start to stacking up on each other. So that's where you are enough is going to lead right into live your truth. That's what we're supposed yeah. to do, right? And according to culture is find whatever's in there, let it out, and then live your truth. But of course, that, that completely goes... Uh, counter to any type of idea that we actually need to repent and turn from our sin and be sanctified and be conformed into the image of Christ day by day. So it's uh, mm. two radically yeah. different worldviews we talk about in the book. Yeah, and I think that even just the your truth, uh, you, you hear that language a lot. It's as if there are many different kinds of truths. And, you know, there there are many different kinds of experiences and personalities um, but I think sometimes the language we use culturally seems to imply that that the truth is not objective, but it's ultimately That's subjective right. and it comes from within and you create it. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you, uh, Charles Taylor, he calls our culture the age of the expressive individual. And I thought that was an apt description. Uh, but it's almost like that's a sacred core of our culture. Like you cannot contradict anyone's quote unquote truth. Uh, you, mm -hmm. you can't criticize it. You can't disagree with it. Um, would you agree with that? That that's kind of the sacred core of our culture? And if so, how did we get to this place? 
I, I think Nancy Piercy did a great job of explaining how we got here. Um, I think and it was in her book, Total Truth, where she talks about um, upper and lower story without getting into too many details. Essentially what she's she says, and I think she's right, is that for many years in our culture, people viewed, you know, every, nobody lives like a relativist. Nobody in real life lives as if all truth is relative, right? Everybody goes to the bank, they expect their money to be there. If a law is broken, they expect to be able to appeal to the law and and, and defend themselves in court or, or prosecute accordingly. Nobody actually lives as if relativism is true. But what Nancy Piercy points out is that in our culture, it morality and religion have been moved into the subjective category, the live your truth category. And that whole language of live your truth actually changes the definition of truth from something that's fixed and objective to something that's relative to each person. And mm. um, I, and so I think in our culture, it's like the ultimate heresy is telling somebody they're wrong about their religion or that they're wrong about something that they think are those should and shouldn'ts, right? The morality uh, uh, of things. And so, but the, here's the problem. I The live your truth sort of hashtag and, and the whole way that slogan was popularized was ultimately, I saw it popularized even by Oprah to give abuse victims a voice and say, you know, you need to speak yeah. your truth about that. And I think sure. that the that the impetus behind that is good, right? That's a good motivation oh, to be able to speak to abuse victims. But here's the problem. By changing the definition of truth to your truth, even for the abuse victim, essentially the message you're sending is, well, it's just true for you. Whereas what a yeah. better and more powerful message even to give to abuse victims to say, speak the truth, because the truth, the truth is true for everyone, not just for you. And it's mm. true in reality. It lines up with what's real. Truth is what corresponds with reality. And you speaking even what happened to you, it corresponds with reality. And that's true for everybody. So I even yeah. think that it's more powerful to say, speak the truth or live the truth. Because ultimately, all of us want what we think about the world to line up with reality. Yeah, I think that's huge. And I, you know, I, I was curious because I, I think it plays the, the the most, I guess, dramatic way. Or maybe that's not the right word. The most clear way you're seeing that ideology or that language play out in our culture is with the LGBTQ and the trans movement and like with pronouns. And, you know, you're a parent. I, um and you have kids, I, I, I don't know if your kids go to public school, but a lot of things that you're seeing in public schools is, is kind of this new thing where you, you uh, get to tell people your pronouns and then they then have to use the preferred pronouns that you have for yourself. And, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to be, uh, um, I don't want to be like create further problems for people that already feel bullied and stuff like that. Uh, however, I think that, um, this is just this is just an outplaying of this live your truth ideology, and so, um, yeah. How how do you how do you think about the the trans movement, the pronouns? Um, do you see that as kind of a, a the fruit of of this sacred core to our culture of truth is ultimately subjective? I get to invent it for myself, and nobody can disagree with that. Yeah, I, I think that's I do agree with that one hundred percent. My kids are fourteen and eleven. Yeah. And it is the number one issue that they are confronted with from everywhere. We've done public school, private school, and we're homeschooling this year. So we've done yeah. all of it. And it's everywhere. It's literally everywhere. You can't turn around. You can't go to a store and not be confronted with the, the, the trans ideology. And like you, I have nothing but total compassion in my heart for somebody who is going through dysphoria, especially young people, if they're experiencing um, you know, gender dysphoria. Oh my gosh, so much compassion goes out from my heart to them. But here's the problem with being confronted with it everywhere is there's this phenomenon called rapid onset gender dysphoria, mm. where kids are being told essentially, you know, that this is something you have to kind of, you, you have to choose for yourself what your gender is. And if you don't feel uh, you know, if you don't, if you haven't thought about it, you need to. And so this rapid onset, we're seeing astronomical numbers of young yeah. people, even in my own kids' friend groups, I see this happen, where it's not that they actually, I think, are struggling with their gender, but they've been told, hey, if I want to be a loving person, if I want to be um, accepting of other people, I and, and, you know, for a kid that 
has a heart that loves a lot of people yeah. and they're being told, Hey, for you, for you to be the most loving, you have to be called, you're called a pansexual. And so then they start identifying that way because that's what it, they're being told is the most loving way to be. And so this, um, this co social contagion, the way that this is being talked about, I, I think is very real. I mean, I'm seeing it absolutely everywhere. My, the number one thing my kids have to kind of figure out in their own little social interactions is what to do about being asked their pronouns because among their, their yeah. age group, that's the first question you ask somebody. It's like saying, hi, how are you? It's the yeah. new, how are you? It's what are your pronouns? And so navigating that is, uh, oh man, it's, it is not for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And you know, to what you just said about how I think a lot of kids, you know, and they, they do want people to know that they're, they care about them and they're loving and accepting, but you're right. There's so much pressure to be loving and accepting as culture defines it. Um, and how do you, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, what is your personal opinion about how Christians should engage do you think Christians should put their pronouns? Do you, as it, like, let's, we have a lot of people in the workplace uh, that have diversity, equity, inclusion officers now that are kind of, they're not really policing that, but there's definitely, uh, there's definitely institutional backing for a lot of this stuff. And so how should Christians uh, with specifically with the, the um, gender dysphoria, LGBTQ pronouns, the, this kind of new sexual revolution that's going on, how should Christians interact with that? Um, so, you know, navigating that in a, on a personal relational level, I think is a different question than do I put the pronouns in my, you know, for my work or yeah, something. That's a um, good distinction. Yeah. Those are kind of two different questions. Yeah. So let me, let me address the, the one at work. I, it's my conviction I don't think Christians should do it. I don't think Christians should be pressured or bullied into doing something like that. Um, and yes, that's going to mean that maybe you get, you don't get that promotion or maybe you get fired. I don't know. I mean, that, that's, that's a difficult thing to navigate for people, but here's what we have to keep in mind back in the first century. Um, you know, the Roman empire, you could worship whoever you wanted. They didn't, they didn't care what your, yeah. how many gods you worshiped or what they were called. As long as Caesar was Lord, this is why, you know, arguably the earliest creed in all of Christianity, Jesus is Lord, was so subversive and so yeah. powerful because they were saying, no, Caesar's not Lord, Jesus is Lord. But the Roman Empire didn't care who you worshipped. And so a lot of times we think of Christians being persecuted in the first century, like the gladiator arenas and being lit on fire in Nero's <laughs> gardens. Right. But, the, but probably what was more of a pressure in a more consistent manner all the time everywhere Whereas little things like, for example, if you went to someone's house, it was customary to bow to the household God. That was just polite. It was taboo to not honor the God or gods of that particular household. Well, Christians had to navigate things like that. And I think the pronoun issue is very similar to that. We have yeah. to be willing, like the first century Christians, to say, no, we can't put our pinch of incense in the bowl for Caesar, whatever that might mean. And we've got to leave that in the hands of God. We can't bow to the household idol, which might get us outcast from social circles. That might happen. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that in, in a, on an official level, as far as like putting it in your bio or something like that, I don't think we should capitulate to culture on that. Because really what that is doing is living by a lie. It's essentially saying we agree with the lie that I choose this for myself. And, right. um, you know, Christians have or, navigated that in some creative ways. I know a guy who got yeah. an exemption who said he was genderless, so he didn't have to. I don't know what how that all works, but <laughs> <laughs> it's right. crazy time. Yeah. You, you know, and, and uh, it's it, it also reminds me of Daniel in Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar said you can worship whatever God you want in private, but. As long as at 12 o'clock every day or whatever, you go out into the public square and you bow down to the image. Um, and, you know, it, again, to your point from um, earlier, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, it is always going to be countercultural to be faithful to Jesus, no matter how much cultural, you know, and I, I actually think we've talked about this before. Paul says, preach the word in season and out of season to Timothy. And I think uh, for the last hundred years, the word was in season in American Christianity, but we're kind of entering into a time where it's out of season. And so that's going to require a cost. But I just hope that um, 
I hope everybody listening to this just can prepare yourself to have a whole lot of grace for people that are struggling with this and especially for teenagers just kind of a crazy world that our teenagers are living in and stuff that they're getting thrown at them and so let's have grace with this as we talk to people uh but uh, thank you for bringing that up um so kind of continuing with this live your truth culture that we're living in um you know i i find it interesting that you you're kind of an apologetics person you've stepped into that space uh, but 50 years ago, apologetics was, you know, you go through the classical arguments for the existence of God, and the, there was the moral argument, the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, and uh, apologetics has kind of changed, it seems like, a little bit, like, because um, some of those old answers are to questions that people aren't really asking anymore, and I've heard people talk about how this modern culture is actually very religious, just in different ways. And so I'm curious, have you noticed how apologetics has changed over the years? And I mean, at least with another gospel, it seems like a lot of what you're doing is apologetics within the church to people that have kind of let go of historic Christianity. Have you noticed a shift there? And uh, what do you kind of see as the space that God is calling you to step into with that? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a good question. That's an interesting observation because I think those arguments, like the ones you mentioned, are still quite robust and relevant. But the problem is yeah. people don't care anymore because they don't yeah. actually think truth exists. And if it does, it, that it, it could be known. So it's like, okay, great. You do your little Kalam argument. That's great. I'm going to be over here doing this. You live your truth and I'll live mine. You know, so it's we have to kind of back up. And I think the greatest battle apologetically right now is just making the case for truth because yeah. people just don't think truth is is fixed especially when it would come to something like religion or morality. And so it's interesting, as I've studied the deconstruction movement and the progressive Christianity movement, when you mention apologetics in that world, it's like this big eye roll. You know, it's like, oh, apologetics, that's just for that's just for scared Christians who want to like reinforce what they think and, you know, circle the wagons or something. And which is so odd because really what apologetics does is engage all the difficult questions. We we want to say, hey, bring whatever question you have. We want to engage it. There's yeah. no question that's off the table. We want to engage our doubts. We want to be on a continual search for truth. But the problem is that in our culture right now, it's really more about asking questions than it is finding answers. And that might mm. sound odd to people because you would think that the reason you would ask a question is to find an answer. But if you're in that kind of relativistic, live your truth kind of space, really you're just trying to find the next good question and you want to actually avoid landing on an official position. Uh, because in the progressive movement and the deconstruction movement, if you land on a fixed answer about what you might think about the nature of God or what the Bible is, you're kind of viewed like you're still in the kindergarten phase of your faith and you need to yeah, become more enlightened and sort of live in the questions. And uh, and so it really kind of celebrates a culture of doubt and a culture of agnosticism. And so to your final question there about where I think God is leading me into in this discussion, I've always felt very clear that my main mission was to the church. Uh, I'm not going to probably be on college campuses debating atheists like some of my friends do, and they do a great job at that. Yeah. Um, but I think I'm called to to people who want the truth, who who know the truth, but maybe they don't always have words for it to help yeah. give them language to articulate some of that stuff. And um, so I'm very comfortable in that space because I really do believe that's where God's called me to to be. Yeah, I I love that. Uh, thank you for sharing that. You know, along that line, could could you share the mission of your podcast that you you talk about every time you do a video? It's like three things I, that I loved, and I just want you to share it with everyone. Yeah, we so uh, the podcast exists to equip Christians to identify the core beliefs of historic Christianity, discern its counterfeits, and proclaim the gospel with clarity, kindness, and truth. And one of the reasons I use the phrase historic Christianity is because I want to swing the net. I want to throw the net as wide as I can, as far as uh, across denominations, across, you know, we are not going to be focusing on secondary issues. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about some of those issues sometimes and what I think is the biblical view, but really keeping those core essentials separate. And, and that's what we're contending for is the one faith passed down once for all, like we read about in Jude. Yeah, uh, that's huge. You, you know, to your point about how just making a case for truth, um, 
I do think that people are hungry for s- something solid to stand on. In this sea of relativism, I think you're starting to see a hunger for that again. Um, you know, I, I remember C.S. Lewis and his reflections on the Psalms. He's writing about um, the, the Psalm that talks about, My delight is in the law of the Lord, and on that law he meditates day and night, the man of God in Psalm 1. And he has a quote where he says, The psalmist's delight in the law is not, is not unlike the pedestrian's delight in touching firmness after a false shortcut has long entangled him in muddy fields. You know, so right when he, his feet step back on the paved road, there's a pleasure in that. And so I, I just thought it was a really cool image for, uh, I do think there is a hunger. Um, have, you, have you seen that from people, that there's a, a, a kind of a hunger for certainty in this moralistic, morally relativistic culture? I think we're starting to see it. Um, I, I, I think we're not right in the bullseye of it yet, but I do, I can see that on the horizon. In fact, this might sound kind of odd and out of left field, but there's this whole movement of homesteaders and they're like these millennial families that are going out and buying a bunch of acreage and raising cows and chickens and homeschooling their kids. <laughs> I think that's part of it. I think people are just yeah. like, you know, we're going to be out here and we'll try to repopulate society when you all mess it, <laughs> when you all make it all go crazy. <laughs> But yeah, I've often joked, like my daughter will say, I just, she says, I feel like my generation or even the one underneath me is just going to be like so rebelling against all this stuff. You know, all of this crazy, radical, radical ideologies that are just causing so much, wreaking so much havoc. And I think she may be right. Yeah, I I think so. Um, so you, you wrote a blog a while back that kind of made the rounds, and it's the, the title was Five Signs Your Church Might Be Heading Towards Progressive Christianity. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned was feelings become more important than facts. Uh, can you expand on that a little bit? And uh, I guess how do you see that playing out in Christianity today? Just this emotivism, um, I guess. So, so the shift of the authority is shifted from the Bible. So that view of the Bible is yeah. kind of wobbly. And then it's really put onto the self. Now, you know, feelings emphasized over facts almost sounds kind of rhetorical and and, and big, but in progressive circles, often there is an emphasis on personal conscience. Um, you know, you will read in progressive books, God gave you this inner compass, this, this inner sense of consciousness to even take to the Bible to decide which parts you think are true or false or fact or fiction. Um, there's a, a leader who's very influential in the in the movement who in his book, like he says, he sits down with Jesus, like this mystical kind of Jesus figure that tells him which parts of the Old Testament to agree with and which ones to disagree with. And at that point, you know, you're just being led by your feelings. And I think, you know, you yeah. mentioned the emotiveness and, and this kind of emotional experience driven church experience that so many churches are emphasizing is it is it can be a setup for this because to so uh, emphasize the experiential element um, is to basically tell people to live your truth. It's kind of the Christianized version of live your truth, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I kind of I, I kind of wanted to play that out, tease that out a little bit with a couple different topics that you're seeing, like this feelings over facts, um, and especially kind of what we mentioned with people deconstructing their faith, because that initially starts with an emotional reason, like maybe they were either hurt by church, or uh, they had a social justice concern that they felt the church was falling short on. And so I'm, I'm curious, when it comes to like the patriarchy and feminism, Um, It seems like there's a lot of deconstruction that surrounds uh, that topic and and how evangelical Christianity is patriarchy and women have been oppressed. And so you have some of these books that have come out that are basically kind of deconstructing all of the teachings of historic Christianity. Um, I wonder uh, wonder what your thoughts are on that, um, I guess, specifically when it comes to... um, yeah, I mean, do you think that's an issue? Do you think that's like a big reason why people walk away from from you know Christian orthodoxy? It's like with the, not just with like feminism, patriarchy, but also with like LGBTQ inclusion. Like I know Rachel Hel- Rachel Hel- Held Evans, her book. One of the reasons why she rejected um, you know evangelicalism was because of the LGBTQ issue. She had a bunch of friends that were LGBTQ, and the church treated them. XYZ. 
Um, so I guess talk about, talk about that a little bit. And I wonder if you've kind of um, interacted around that. Yeah. And um, so I'm currently writing and researching a book on deconstruction. So I'm just like in that world all the time, yeah. <laughs> listening to the stories. And it, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that absolutely every deconstruction story that I've ever heard at least will cite that what you've just described either with patriarchy feminism or the lgbtq and usually it's one in the same uh as yeah. at least present in the reasoning behind deconstructing the theology so notice how it's not and, and this is why i i have a co-author and we define deconstruction in a very specific way in the book because it's how it's manifesting on social media and that's a shift of the of the authority for truth from the bible or god to the self because yeah. ultimately what happens is like you you mentioned a social justice concern being maybe the the feminism or the patriarchy or the lgbtq there's an assumption where they begin with assuming the church is wrong about that and therefore then yeah. the church is oppressive about that and then morally wrong and then these moral categories get put on top of it which starts deconstructing the rest of the theology rather than saying okay scripture teaches x y and z so this is our starting point to know what is good and true and how to even define oppression or any of those things and but it's working the opposite way so it's starting with the self it's basically saying i view these things this way and the Bible and the church doesn't line up with that. So I need to deconstruct that. And that's, I mean, a primary manifestation of deconstruction as I see it, as I, as I research the movement. So, yeah, so I kind of, uh, that's really all the questions I, I had written down, but I also wanted to, um, I was curious about, let's talk about feelings a little bit and emotions. Um, I think some people would say that Oh, the church, the church just hasn't really engaged emotionally and, and the mod modernism assumed that we're all walking brains and there's people that assume discipleship is really just an intellectual enterprise. And if we preach enough truth and if we share the word enough uh, with people and get the doctrine in their heads, then they will become disciples. But I mean, we know that even Jesus didn't believe that, you know, cause he, he had some strong words for the Pharisees about pouring themselves over the scriptures, but not coming to him in whom there was life. And so what is, what is a healthy way? You know, it's, it seems like your book is, is centered a lot around, uh, not letting your emotions be your locus for truth. And so what is a healthy way that Christians can engage emotionally and be emotionally healthy? Yeah. Do you have, well, what are your thoughts yeah, on that? So I'm, I'm not naturally an intellectual. I'm much more of a flaky artist feeler kind of person. <laughs> so the emotional yeah. part always came pretty easy to me. And I realize not everybody's that way. Um, but I just think that probably the easiest and most simple way to look at it is that emotion, our emotions shouldn't be in the driver's seat. Truth yeah. should be in the driver's seat. And then emotions can respond to truth. But um, if it's the other way around, if our emotions are in the driver's seat and then we kind of try to try to mold what we think is true around our emotions, that's going to lead us down some really bad paths. So I don't think it means that we need to not have experiences. I think, um, you know, looking out right now, I think there are Christians who have assumed a bit of a naturalistic worldview where they're not even... Uh, you know, they almost naturalize everything, right? So every struggle you might have, it's just something that can be explained naturally. But we know we have an enemy of our soul, this being called the devil. And we need to realize yeah. that he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And that's a supernatural reality um, that a lot of Christians, I think, need to recapture and, re and, you know, understand that there's a supernatural realm going on all around us. And, um, you know, and our experience in worship, but, but it's the driver's seat thing though, because what I found yeah. is I came from a very emotive stream. Worship was very charismatic, very, you know, and today I have much deeper experiences in worship as far as my emotions and my, uh, it connecting with my soul when it's just very simple lights on, nobody's trying to showboat. It's not a big rock show. I just, that's, I, I love those because, and then we're singing hymns and I'm not a hymn snob, but I do love the hymns. You know, you, you sing yeah. those hymns and you just have this, I, I get very moved, much more moved than when I'm in existential, you know, existential angst over the words I'm singing um, in another service that might be just so me focused and, and it just spins me out. So yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, emotion, God, God made us emotional beings. We, 
we should, our emotions should be responding to truth, but we got to start with truth and make sure that they're aligning, that we're lining up our emotions with truth. Yeah, I think, I think that's huge. So you talk a little bit about the, I think I saw your, your interview with Neil Shinvi about the Evangelical Deconstruction Project. Um, and it's, it's kind of like a lot of people that are publicly renouncing their faith. Um, and, you know, without wading into the different authors and different books, um, there seems to be this massive trend to publicly deconstruct. And, you know, you also have this interesting, I don't know if you listened to the Mars Hill podcast about Mark Driscoll, Um, you know, and and I just thought that was, regardless of what people thought of the podcast, I found it to be kind of, uh, I was curious about the motives of why, Um, but it's almost like it's very popular to deconstruct publicly and it's celebrated and cheered. Um, Why do you think that is? Yeah, in, in in the deconstruction book we're working on, we actually have a section where we show the religious nature of deconstruction as it manifests online. And you do, you have the testimony, right? Just like the evangelical yeah. culture they're leaving, there's this strong imp, in, like impetus to want to tell your testimony. And I think yeah. the why, I think why that is, and this is what is so hard for so many Christians to understand, because if I deconstructed and I wasn't a Christian anymore, I would be, I think I would be really sad. I would be really devastated yeah. if if I lost belief in what I think is the most beautiful way to look at the world, I would be very sad. And I probably wouldn't sure. want to tell when a lot of people about it. And I would just, I don't know, but but that's not what's happening. What's happening is people have determined that Christianity is toxic and abusive and oppressive to people. So when they break out of that, the impetus to tell people how free they feel now and how happy they are now and how much better their lives are is really strong. I think because they want other people to experience the same freedom and happiness that they've experienced. So there's this, this deep sense in deconstruction that Christianity yeah. is, is just this system that's been propped up to control people, fill them with the fear of hell and get them to do whatever you want. And so they genuinely feel like they've escaped some kind of cult or some sort of toxic system. I think there's also a lot of dopamine that you get from like demonstrating your membership to a tribe, like publicly. I I think there's a lot of tribalism going on. And, uh, you know, most of what happens online is basically people just signaling to their own tribe. Like this, this is the group that I belong to. And I think sometimes if we can get underneath that, that's where person to person interactions are so much more fruitful than online interactions. Um, just because everyone, it, it's very performative. The culture we're living in is very performative. And it's its uh, really true of people that deconstruct. Like they want to perform that partially to show their new tribe, I guess, a little bit. I mean, is, is that fair to say? Uh, I do. I, yeah, absolutely. Because this is the thing. If you search the deconstruction hashtag on yeah. in any social media platform, hundreds of thousands of posts are going to come up. And you're right. It's a complete and total tribe with its own language, its own catchphrases, its own hashtags. Huh. The whole approach to reality is very much the same. And it's it's very religious in its nature. And that's one of the things we talk about in the book is just the religious nature of it. You have the great, not the great commission, but the great decommission. You have the testimony. Yeah. You have the priests and prophets. You have the people leading the conferences. There are conferences and there's merch and there's also everything that, yeah. you know, is is indicative of almost this religious fervor. And you're right there. I, I, I think you've nailed it right, right on the head. Um, you know, and I think one of the one of the reasons why deconstruction is so uh, I, I think one of the we talk about bits, bits of truth and all these things, but. Um, One of the things is because we haven't really created a lot of space in churches for people to honestly share their doubts. And we haven't really underlined that as a part of a healthy faith because that's what it is. Doubt means your faith is thriving. It means you're actually honestly pressing into questions. And so, you know, like how can you, how can we create space for people that are deconstructing and for people that are maybe struggling with doubts? Um, We've even had people that left our church Um, especially teenagers that have left when they got to college and they will say later on, well, I just didn't feel like I had any space to ask questions at legacy, which I don't think that's always true. I think maybe that's true in pockets. 
Uh, but I think I think at our church, people are filled with grace. Uh, but for some reason, uh, some people can have that perception. So I just wonder, wonder what your thoughts are on that. So yeah, so this is we've got a whole chapter uh, about this in our in our book coming up. Um, so I think that there's some truth to that. I think there are some churches that would say you can't ask those questions here, and they shut the questions down. I'm sure that exists. Right. I don't think that's as common as the deconstruction movement would have us believe. What I think is more common is that they're not happy with the answers. And um, most churches, most Christians I know would welcome someone's honest question saying, look, I, I'm yeah. really struggling with this. I don't know what to do with this. Help me understand. And then there can be a, a season of walking with that person, discipling. But ultimately, it comes down to, and this is why, you know, when you ask, how can we create space for people who are deconstructing in our church? I'm not sure you can. Yeah. You can try, yeah. but I'm not sure you can because in the deconstruction movement, very often they don't tell people what's happening in their church mm. because they know that they're that they're abandoning historic theology, they're abandoning Christian ethics, and so they've decided these things like to use that word toxic. It's it's viewed as toxic to them, so they're not going to deconstruct in your church. And so you can make space for questions and doubts and try to disciple yeah. people through that, but ultimately there's probably going to come a point when they don't like the answers. And so then they're going to leave, they're going to de deconstruction as a phenomenon is largely happening, happening online. They find communities of people who they can deconstruct together. And they're not doing that in churches because they don't see churches as a safe place. And I'm not sure you, there's anything we could do to try to be safe. That word safe, the only way to be safe would be to compromise and to change our answers. And so, right. you know, obviously we can't do that. So there's a lot going on. Um, like I said, I'm sure that there are some places where they're shutting things down and I don't think that's good. I think they need to create space and say, hey, look, we're open to whatever the questions might be. Um, but at the same time, I think it's not that the questions are unanswered. It's that they don't the answers are not acceptable. And I think yeah. that's probably more what's happening than than the other. So I think that's an important distinction. Uh, you have deconstruction, um, which is kind of a new word and that sometimes is shorthand for walking away from the faith. <laughs> and then you have honest doubts and questions. And I think those are kind of two different things. And deconstruction sometimes is like a tribal indicator that I'm walking away from this community and I'm joining a new, a new community that has different values. Um, which I think, I think is a healthy distinction to have. Um, but you know what? We've taken up a lot of your time, and I want to wrap us up here. But I, I'll get in trouble if I don't ask you to to give us a little Zoe girl. Uh, which, which give us a little uh, chorus of your favorite Zoe girl song. <laughs> we've got some Zo We've got some fans. We've got some fans in our uh, church. Well, our I found first out. our first single was I believe I wrote that song. Yeah. So let me see if I can remember the chorus. Now I'll shout it from a mountain that I'm not the same that I used to be. I believe in God, believe in God. But you know what bugs me now? I What's wrote that? that. I wrote that before I was like writing books. And now it bugs me every time because it says I'm not the same <laughs> that I used to be. It should be as I used to be. Oh, yeah. It's, it's going to bug you forever. Grammar wasn't, um, you know, a priority back then. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I didn't. I didn't really intend to get in both of your t into both of your two future books, but uh, thank you so much for sharing with us, and um, we look forward to um, seeing your new book. And I know a lot of people are going to be interested in another gospel. And is, is there any resources just to kind of? Oh, there it is, right there. Live your truth and. And I did pre-order it. I've got it coming in the mail. So uh, if you want to support Elisa, go ahead and pre-order that. Or if you just like her writing. Um, but if there's any any way, um, are, are there any other resources that you would maybe point us to? Um, as we talk about progressive Christianity, false narratives in our culture, how to engage the younger generation that's kind of swimming in this stuff. Um, what would you, what are some of your favorites? Yeah, I think Summit Ministries is doing a great job with the younger generation. So is Impact 360. They're doing a great job. Um, man, I mean, I, I love there's I have a resource page on my website. Actually, it says all my favorite podcasts oh, and great. books on different things. You can go to my website, alisachilders.com for that. Uh, but yeah, as far as uh, Cross Examined is doing some great work, Stand to Reason is doing some great work, Jay Warner Wallace. 
Um, there's so many great resources out there right now uh, that are tackling yeah. these things head on. And um, yeah, Mike Winger has a great YouTube channel that interacts with a lot of this um, very often. So yeah, there's a lot of good stuff out there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Um, and we look forward to hearing more from you. And, and thank you for the gift that you've been to the church. And uh, yeah, we hope you have a great week.